How important is the Sabbath day? To Orthodox Judaism, the Sabbath observance is everything. It's the life of their faith and the soul of their national identity. The Law of Moses clearly established a perpetual Sabbath day observance. Moses wrote, Observe the Sabbath, because it is holy to you. Anyone who desecrates it must be put to death. Whoever does any work on that day must be cut off from his people. For six days work is to be done. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath must be put to death. The Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for the generations to come as an everlasting covenant. It is a sign between me and the Israelites forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he abstained from work and rested. Failure to honor the Sabbath demanded a death sentence. This is a serious violation in Judaism. When the children of Israel honored the Sabbath, they honored the covenant of God. This is the reason why God instituted the Sabbath. It was to be a constant reminder of their covenant with Him. Initially, the Sabbath was honored by the children of Israel, but subsequent generations treated the Sabbath observance with indifference. Isaiah the prophet warned the children of Israel about their violation of the Sabbath and their desire to do as they please on God's holy day. Jeremiah the prophet also warned the nation of Israel about their Sabbath violations. He even referred to them as stiff-necked people who would not listen or respond to discipline. When the children of Israel ignored the Sabbath, they also ignored God's covenant and their responsibility to it. This indifference eventually resulted in the Assyrian and Babylonian diasporas, the forced removal of the children of Israel from their homeland, and the destruction of Solomon's temple. The northern kingdom of Israel was conquered by the Assyrian, Shemanser V, around 722 BC, and they were deported to the territories of present-day Iran. The kingdom of Judah was conquered in 588 BC by Nebuchadnezzar II of Babylon and deported to the lands of Mesopotamia. The Jewish people began returning from their Babylonian captivity around 536 BC and began construction of the second temple around 520 BC that became known as the temple of Zerubbabel. This temple was completed in 64 AD, just six years before its destruction by the Romans. These were the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. According to tradition, Nehemiah founded a library and collected books about the kings and prophets and the writings of David and letters of kings about votive offerings. The book of Nehemiah suggests that the priest scribe Ezra brought the Torah back from Babylon to Jerusalem during the construction of the second temple. Tradition also indicates that Ezra translated the Torah into the Aramaic Targums and these writings were read to the people. This horrid captivity taught the children of Israel to never treat the covenant of God and the Sabbath observance with indifference again. The nation of Israel so feared violation of the Sabbath that by the time of Jesus, the true meaning of the Sabbath was lost in useless regulation. With the construction of the temple and the synagogue system, the Sabbath became a day of worship, study of the law, and cessation from secular employment. It was during the historical period 
between Ezra and the Christian era that the spirit of Jewish legalism flourished. Innumerable restrictions and rules were formulated for the conduct of life under the law. Two entire treaties of the Halakha found in the Mishnah are devoted to Sabbath observance. In the Mishnah, there is recorded 39 father clauses of prohibitive actions, and each class had its subsection of derivative works or descendants. Please note the categories. Some of the Halakha interpretation went to extreme. For example, associated with plowing was the admonishment not to dig. For example, it was forbidden to draw a chair along the ground on the Sabbath day, lest it should make a rut and violate the law of plowing. To walk with a crutch or wooden leg was permissible, but to go on stilts was forbidden. It was believed that the stilts did not carry the man, but the man carried the stilts. Neither was it permissible to wear false teeth or an unnecessary garment. Carrying a bedroll on the Sabbath day was also strictly prohibited. This class also included the plucking of an ear or a blade. A woman must not look into her mirror on the Sabbath lest she discover a gray hair and be tempted to pluck it out. This action was also classified as reaping. Winnowing usually referred exclusively to the separation of chaff from grain and selectively refers exclusively to the separation of debris from grain. Thus, filtering undrinkable water to make it drinkable falls under this category as does picking small bones from fish. Even to the present day, Orthodox and some conservative authorities rule that it is prohibited to turn electrical devices on or off as falling under one of the 39 categories of work. However, the rabbis are not in agreement about exactly which category or categories this falls under. One common solution to the problem of electricity involves using preset timers for electrical appliances to turn them on and off automatically with no human intervention. A conflict was coming. Five events cemented the rupture between Jesus and the Jewish hierarchy. The first conflict came when Jesus journeyed to Jerusalem to celebrate a feast of the Jews. It is commonly understood that this feast was probably Jesus' second Passover that occurred on April 25, 31 AD. Jesus walked by a pool near the Sheep Gate, known as the Pool of Bethesda. The pool is said to have five covered porches. It was the superstition of a hopeless multitude of infirm people who believed that angels stirred the water and the first person into the pool would be healed. There was a man at the pool who was crippled for 38 years lying near the pool. Jesus interacted with the man and eventually healed him of his disease by stating, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. Jesus was aware that he healed this man on the Sabbath day. He also was aware that the command to carry one's bed was a violation of the traditions of the Pharisees, not the law of Moses. Immediately, the man was made whole by the healing touch of Jesus, and he took up his bed and walked home. When the Jews saw this man carrying his bed, they challenged him about his violation of Sabbath tradition. The man stated, that the one who healed him commanded him to carry his bed in violation of tradition. 
The Jews wanted to know who would blatantly encourage Sabbath violation, and the healed man did not know the identity of his healer. When Jesus heard of the Jewish confrontation, he sought out the healed man in the temple and said, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon thee. This man left this encounter with Jesus and told the Jews that it was Jesus who healed him. The Jews vehemently sought out Jesus to accuse him of blatant Sabbath violation. Their hatred of Jesus even went to the point that they sought to kill him for his violation of their Sabbath traditions. Jesus defended his actions by stating, My father is always at work to this very day and I too am working. And Jesus' response only made things worse because he referred to God as his very own father. At this point, the Jews added a second charge against Jesus and the charge was blasphemy. According to the tradition of the Pharisees, both Sabbath violations and blasphemy were punishable by death by stoning. After this discourse, Jesus departed Jerusalem and went over the Sea of Galilee. And a great multitude followed him because they saw the miracles Jesus did. But the Sadducees and the Pharisees did not forget this incident. Approximately six months later, Jesus returned to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles in late September or early October of 31 AD. And members of the Sanhedrin again charged Jesus with Sabbath violation of their traditions. Jesus defended himself by saying, I did one miracle, and you are astonished. Yet because Moses gave you circumcision, you circumcise a child on the Sabbath. Now if a child can be circumcised on the Sabbath, so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing the whole man on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearance and make a righteous judgment. With the completion of the Passover celebration, Jesus left Jerusalem and returned to Galilee. On the next Sabbath, Jesus and his disciples were hungry, and they went through the cornfields, plucking the ears of corn, and ate them. Certain Pharisees observed this action, and they charged Jesus and his disciples with violation of their Sabbath traditions again. According to Deuteronomy 23, verses 24 through 25, travelers were allowed to pick grains of fruit for immediate consumption, but they were not allowed to harvest. Jesus defended himself by offering a number of proofs. Jesus first charged the Pharisees with ignorance of the scripture, referring to a time when David and his men were hungry and David entered the house of God and ate the showbread. According to Levitical law, the eating of sacred bread was only authorized for the priests. Jesus wisely made use of the justification in the precepts of rabbis that danger to life supersedes the Sabbath law and other obligations. His second argument inferred that the law itself permitted men to work when they were involved in worship and service. Jesus offered Numbers 28, 9 through 19, as proof that the priests worked on the Sabbath day and are blameless. Jesus also chided the Pharisees for their failure to understand the scriptural application of Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, an acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Pharisee legalism harshly demanded compliance to their set of exacting rules. God desires kindness and goodwill in men rather than punctuous observance of traditional rules. The spirit of the law, not the letter, is important. The fourth argument is recorded in Mark chapter 2, verse 27. 
and it was an appeal to the original purpose of the Sabbath. God made man and gave man the Sabbath for rest. He did not institute a Sabbath ritual and create man to serve the ritual. The Sabbath is not an end in itself, but it is a tool to be used by man to worship and serve God. Mark chapter 2 verse 28 also records Jesus' final argument. Since he is the Messiah, the Son of Man, then he is Lord even of the Sabbath. The title of Lord is extracted from the Greek word kurios, which is translated as supreme in authority. Jesus destroyed the argument of the Pharisees by comparing their traditions to the light of the Torah. These men seethed with anger. Instead of examining their traditions, they sought to kill the one who violated them. The third confrontation Jesus experienced over the Sabbath occurred on the same day that Jesus humiliated the Pharisees with the controversy over the plucked grain. They followed Jesus to the Capernaum synagogue, seething with self-righteous indignation. While at the synagogue, the Pharisees encountered a man with a withered hand. Intent on finding a basis to accuse Jesus, the Pharisees hurled this challenge at Jesus. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? The hidden motive of this challenge was to see if Jesus would violate the tradition of the elders by performing an act of healing. According to Pharisee legalism, all application to the outside of the body was forbidden on the Sabbath day. Even to this day, among the Jews, there is widespread controversy as to what medication is allowable on the Sabbath day. Jesus answered this charge by referring to Pharisaic practice. He said to them, If any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a man than a sheep? Jesus challenged the Pharisees who strived to save the lives of working animals on the Sabbath because he understood that to a Pharisee, a lost sheep is lost profit. Jesus then cut the Pharisees to the core when he asked one simple question. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil, to save life or to kill? No answer came from the Pharisees because no righteous answer could come. The true light of the Torah silenced the Pharisees because the foolishness of their traditions was exposed. Since Jesus had no challengers, he turned to the man with the withered hand and said, Stretch forth thine hand. And the man was healed. According to the Gospels, the Pharisees responded in several ways. First, the Pharisees were furious with Jesus because Christ had publicly humiliated them by his devastating arguments. These pious religious men began plotting the death of Jesus. They wanted to murder him because he rejected their traditions. The Pharisees even entered into a heinous alliance with the Herodians, who were their enemies, to support them in their attempts to kill Jesus. On another Sabbath day, while Jesus was teaching in the synagogue, in the crowd was a woman who had a debilitating, crippling disease for over 18 years that prevented her from standing up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hand on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. The chief synagogue rabbi was indignant with Jesus for healing on the Sabbath. He turned to the people and said, There are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The lack of compassion displayed by the ruler of the synagogue 
angered Jesus. And he rebuked the rabbi by saying, You hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath from what bound her? This rebuke humiliated his adversaries, but the people rejoiced in the wonderful things being done in their midst. On another Sabbath day, Jesus was invited to the house of a prominent Pharisee for dinner. Jesus knew that he was being carefully watched, and this invitation most likely was contrived to cause conflict. While at dinner, a man was in front of him who suffered from dropsy. Now dropsy is the swelling of an organ or tissue due to accumulation of excess lymph fluids. Consider this thought. How did this man get into the house of this Pharisee? There can be only one answer to this question. The sick man was brought to the dinner by the Pharisees as a setup to expose Jesus. Jesus understood what this prominent Pharisee was doing. Therefore, he turned to the Pharisees and the experts in the law who were present at the dinner and asked this question. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? None of the Pharisees could come up with a quick-witted answer to this question. Therefore, Jesus healed the man and sent him away. Again, Jesus rebuked the assembled guests when he said, If one of you has a son or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull him out? The Gospel of Luke indicates that these pious religious men said nothing. No doubt. The light of truth exposed the hypocrisy of pharisaic practice. No doubt, this itinerant rabbi from Galilee refused to honor the tradition of the elders and the Talmud concerning the Sabbath day. Jesus shook the very core of Judaism by his radical new interpretation of Sabbath ritual. Jesus could not be controlled. His preaching challenged the status quo and could upset the balance of power in Israel. The new governor, Pontius Pilate, would not tolerate social disobedience in Judea, and the flagrant Sabbath violations of Jesus could inspire the multitudes to follow his example. The Jewish Sanhedrin feared that the violations of Jesus could cause them to lose control of the people. The Pharisees responded in two ways. They were furious with Jesus because he publicly humiliated them by his devastating arguments. The second reaction is more sinister. They plotted the murder of Jesus. They wanted Jesus dead because he rejected their traditions. The Pharisees even went so far as to enter into an alliance with the Herodians, who were their enemies, to murder Jesus. There is no way to downplay the importance of these Sabbath day controversies, because these Sabbath violations marked an important development. The opposition and hatred of the Pharisees and the Sadducees was no longer hidden. Open hostility now dictated the future actions of the Sanhedrin. These same pious Jews determined to put Jesus to death and solicited help even from their enemies to accomplish their murderous goals. It would be easy to judge the murderous hypocrisy of the Pharisees as pure evil. But let's not be too hard on them, because the law of Moses did require a death sentence for Sabbath violation. The Jews only sought a way to fulfill the dictates of Scripture in a Roman world. Why did the Pharisees and the Sadducees 
fail to understand the spirit of the Torah and the teachings of Jesus? There can be only one answer. Religion about God was more important than relationship with God. The Sanhedrin was more concerned about dotting their I's and crossing their T's in their theological debate. This action caused them to fail to see the divine revelation found in Jesus. Let's not be too hard on these sanctimonious religious men because we are just like them. We often fail to see the spirit of Christ in our brothers and sisters due to our denominational rhetoric. Which is more important, our doctrines about Christ or the Spirit of Christ in our midst? Over the years, I have heard many fundamentalist brethren reject their Pentecostal brothers because they speak in tongues. Often you would hear such statements as, you know, that those who speak in tongues are of the devil. The same can also be said about our Pentecostal brethren who taught that those who do not speak in tongues are going to hell. How foolish must we be? It's interesting to note that when we allow doctrine to be more important than unity in the body of Christ, we all fail the Great Commission of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. Lost humanity does not want our theological debate. They hunger for the Spirit of Christ within us. Stop and ask yourself these questions. Do you separate yourself from brothers and sisters in Christ due to denominational rhetoric? Is it your desire for there to be unity in Christ and the family of God? Each and every one of us must honestly answer these questions.